Good morning. Good morning. All right, we are now recording. I'm going to go to, let's see if I can pull up our class and make some announcements. Hold on, that's not ready. Not ready. All right, I can't believe it. We're just moving through this course so fast. Let's do this again. Okay. There we go. Old Testament. Here we are. All right. Somebody let me know if you can see our Old Testament page. Did it work for us? Yes. Okay. Yes. Super. <laughs> I always get scared with this thing. All right, a few announcements. <coughs> this week, we are in week four. We're going to be discussing the book of Exodus. Um, and we're going to discuss this today. Somebody might want to jot this down. What does Exodus mean? Somebody's going to um, share that for us in just a little bit in our discussion. What does Exodus mean? Uh, no, okay, and um, you want to read up on chapter two. You have your Exodus discussion post for this week. I'll go to that in just a second. Uh, third announcement, our midterm exam will be posted next week. Midterm exam will be posted next week. What will it be on? So we're going to recap on um, the chapters that we covered. So it will be the chapter on geography in your introduction. We will be the chapter on Genesis and our chapter uh, today, chapter five on Exodus. So once again, make sure you're taking notes of the past four, well, three, four weeks. OK, so you're going to go back, check out that introduction, geography, make sure geography, uh, you look at that chapters. I think that's like chapters one and two. You're going to take a look at Genesis. I think that's chapter four. And today is Exodus. Take a look at those notes. The midterm exam will be posted on Monday. Remember, once again, we start our weeks on Mondays and we end on Sundays. So the midterm exam will be due on Sunday, Sunday, Sunday night. I think we're going to be into November, right? Because next week, next week starts off the 31st and then 31st and that'll be due November the 6th. Can you believe we're into November next week? This year is gone. All will, right. Will we have <laughs> will we have class next week? Yes. Okay. Yes, we'll have class next week. Okay. It'll, okay. It'll be on Leviticus, but the exam will cover up to Exodus. Correct. Correct. Okay. Good question. All right, everybody, um, this week, week four, we're in week four, so make sure if you are watching the video, if you're not with us, you are going to the week four tab for this week. Your discussion question comes from your textbook question number seven on page 121. We're going to talk a lot about Moses today, uh, the character Moses. Um, I want you to look at uh, question number seven, page 121, and I want you to um, characterize Moses on the basis of how he is portrayed in the Exodus accounts, in the book of Exodus. How is the character Moses or the man Moses um, uh, characterized? How is he portrayed in uh, the book of Exodus, in the accounts? And so how do you answer that? So you're going to use your textbook, the chapter on Exodus, to help you. You can also use um, your your Bible so you can use, you know, many of us go online for an online translation or you have your physical Bible. Um, you may find examples, find the examples of him talking, find the examples of him interacting with his father in law, find examples of him interacting with the people of Israel, interacting with um, his sister. Sister, is this Sister Miriam uh, with his wife, Sephora, um, 
You can find examples, multiple examples of him leading the people. Was he always strong? Was he always sure of himself? And then and you're going to find different um different portrayals of Moses. So I'm, I'm going to uh, really be interested in seeing your uh, accounts in your discussion forum uh, for week four. Remember to engage your classmates as well. I've been reading over your discussion. Sometimes I try to respond to as many people as I can. Um, and sometimes I can't get to everybody, but I want to make sure that you at least hear from me sometimes in your discussions. Make sure that you're responding to other classmates. I see some people do uh, and some people don't. Also, make sure that um, if you have information from other sources, make sure that you quote them as well. OK, but your discussion posts have been awesome. We go back. All right, everybody, let me pause real quick and let me bring up our lesson. And we're going to go to Exodus. OK, while I'm pulling up our PowerPoint, somebody know what the word Exodus means? I think it says. <laughs> going out or departure, I think it's what it says. Going out or departure. Mm -hmm. It seems. Uh, Reverend Marshall, you was going to say something. Were you saying something? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing that uh, Brother Smith was going to say. All right. Exodus. Um, Reverend Marshall, can you see my PowerPoint? It says Exodus. Yes, ma'am. All right. OK, we're ready to roll. We're in Chapter 5 for those of us who those who are watching. The recording, you can follow along with us. All right, everybody. So, oh, y'all. OK, wait. This is the reason why I write myself notes, and if I don't write myself notes, you know what happens? I forget. Um, I wanted to review your homework assignment from last week. And let me pull this up real quick. Y'all remember what you did last week, the Old Testament chart? Mm -hmm. the, Old chart. Mm -hmm. the Old Testament genre chart assignment. Right. All right. You all yes. did a wonder wonderful job. All right. I'm going to actually pull up um, Walter's here. I'm going to pull up yours <laughs> so we can get it on the screen. OK, students. I'm going to go back to Exodus. I'm sorry about that. If I'm telling you, if I don't write something down, I forget. OK, I'm going to use one of our students' papers who did a wonderful job. All of you did. I got through just a few of them. I didn't finish all of them, so don't get scared. All right, how many books are in the Old Testament? And you already have it. You know that there are 39. Mm -hmm. All right, so I want to go through real quick, let's just do a review of the genres. When we say genre, that's the type. So isn't it interesting, y'all, how the Old and New Testament come together? These wonderful people put the canon together. So that's what we call the whole Holy Bible. It's called a canon. And uh, these people who we will never know their names, these editors and like in our daytime, we would call them like a publisher, right? They put this wonderful book together called the Holy Bible, and none of the none of the books stand alone. They all work together. And as Hebrew literature, the other part of this um, name of this course, Old Testament Hebrew literature, there are genre types. And you'll see that there are groupings or families. So they lump these uh, categories together. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five, and you could have two, two answers for genre. So some may say it's the law, L-A-W, or the Pentateuch. Okay, so you may have had law or the Pentateuch. The first five books are called the Pentateuch. 
And we're going to talk more about that. It's what our Jewish friends call the Torah. This is their basis. Everything is based off of these first five books. OK, the Pentateuch. Also called the laws. And so these first five books, we are going to go through these. So you, we already hit Genesis. We're in uh, Exodus now, Leviticus next week, and Numbers and De De Deuteronomy. We we got to hit those first five. They're very important. They give instructions to the people. Uh, they uh, This was God's way of telling them how to live, what to do, what not to do. So you see just that it's a lot of law. It's a lot of rules. It's a lot. And it, um, let me just say this real quick. Mm, why do you think that the creator God was giving them a lot of laws and rules in the beginning? <laughs> what did we talk about last week? What, what happened last week in Genesis? I was going to say, a Professor, that he wanted them to be a priestly tribe. He wanted them to be an example for the, the entire world. Excellent. Because in Genesis, what did they, what, it was two, two folks messed us up. <laughs> Adam and Eve. <laughs> right. Adam messed and us Eve. all up. Okay. And huh. because of their fall, Humans fell into sin, and as Reverend Marshall said, well, the Creator God did not leave the human race alone, but wanted them to be better and to be holy. How? Through these rules, through these laws, and we're going to look at more of those. I don't want to get into everything right now, especially when we get into the book of Leviticus. It's just a lot of codes and stuff like that. Very good. All right, let's go to our next genre, our next lumping. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. These are what we call historical books because they do just that. They tell the story. Um, sometimes you may see them called narratives. Okay, so Joshua through Esther, oh my goodness, they tell wonderful stories, but these stories are true. These stories are real, real people. All of these people existed, okay? All of the places existed, okay? All right, I have one of the sections duplicated, so I apologize for that. Okay, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You may have two answers for this one. So it may be poetry or poetic. Some may say um, wisdom. Okay. And we'll get to those a little bit later in the semester. All right, let's head on down to the last two categories. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. These are major prophets, not because they were better than anybody, but we say major prophets because they have a larger book. Okay, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They have their books are longer. Okay, they're longer than who? They're longer than the minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These are called minor prophets, not because they were less important, but just because their books are smaller. Okay, just because their books are smaller, that's all. All right. And so now when you're doing your study and your research, um, some of you teach, some of you preach. And so as you're educating your people, your friends, you'll be able to tell them a little bit more about those books. OK, let me go back to our lesson. Everybody all right? 
Okay. Okay, we're going to go back to Exodus. All right. Very good. You have the definition of Exodus. So we're in the second book um, of, the, of the Old Testament and the second book in the Pentateuch. If you pay attention to this picture on the right, we're talking about, um, we said the word Exodus was leaving out or, or moving out. And so the key people that we chronicle in the Old Testament are Israelite people. These uh, Israelites or um, the people of Israel, you'll hear them call, or Hebrew people, had to flee out of Egypt. Once again, remember, you got to tell your people, Egypt is located in Africa. So they leave out of Egypt. They got to get up out of there because of a particular leader named Pharaoh. Anybody know anything about uh, Pharaoh? You can open up your mic. I'm going to turn my heat off. Okay. Somebody jumping in there? Okay. okay. Well, yes, go right ahead. I think it, it's just a title. It's, you know, like king or queen. It's just the title. Pharaoh was just the leader of Egypt at that time, but it's just a title. Correct. It was his title. Very good. Very good. Um, how did this Pharaoh treat the Israelite people? I'll say it like that. Very bad. Mm hmm Very bad. <laughs> Poorly. Horrible. In the next sentence I have there, um, these Israelite people were in, uh, forced into slavery. And I just want to pause right here. The book of Exodus, um, the Israelite people and Moses have a lot of similarities to the African-American experience. Um, this book of the Bible, especially during slavery, gave African-Americans uh, or enslaved Americans, I'll put it like that, gave them some type of hope, gave them something to um, hold on to because they saw how, or they heard the story, should I say, of how these Israelites were forced into slavery, um, hurt and abused just like they were. Um, so there were similarities uh, to the struggles that our enslaved uh, ancestors uh, suffered, put it like that. And many times, I, I'm, I might be kind of going off on a tangent here, some of our African-American leaders were also referred to as like a Moses. For example, Harriet Tubman was referred to as a Moses of her time, helping to, you know, get the slaves out of and moving them out of a horrible situation. All right. So we got the definition of exodus. It means leaving out, it means departing. And remember the key thing, you may see this next week, the key thing, who are the people we're chronicling? Who are the people who are moving? It's the Israelites. They're moving or they're leaving from Egypt. Okay, so the book of Exodus has a lot of history in it. Um, has a lot of history in it. And actually, I'm going to pull up something here. Uh, actual, true history. Let's see if I can pull up something. Many times, and I'm going to read this real quick. Many times, I'm just going to, I'm in my Bible, Exodus chapter 1. I want you to also pay attention to, when you start to read now as a scholar, Pay attention to the, the captions over top of your chapter. Pay attention to the people. Um, and so in Exodus chapter one, it opens up with history. Let me read this real quick. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob. 
So this is like a continuation from the book of Genesis. OK, it kind of keeps going with Jacob, each with his family. So remember people, Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher, the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. And so I just read that was um, Exodus chapter one, verse one. So it opens up, the book of Exodus opens up as almost like a continuation from Genesis. Okay, so it picks up where Genesis just stopped. Well, when we say who wrote the book, we, with every book, we, we always want to say, why was it written? Who wrote it? Or who do we think wrote it? OK, it is thought that Moses wrote this book. It is it has been attributed to Moses. And also, let me let me say this, too. Um, I'm on my I'm actually on my phone. But if you have a paper, anybody have a paper Bible with you right now? And if you go to somebody, go to Exodus chapter one in the beginning of your book, see if, excuse me, in the beginning of your Bible, see if it tells you the author. And if so, just let me know. Um, okay. If anybody gets it, just let me know. So it's thought that Moses wrote it. However, uh, it can be disputed. It seems that Moses may have written some parts of the book, or maybe he dictated some parts of the book. Remember, y'all, we don't really know who actually penned it. And then sometimes the, in some places, it seems like um, somebody else wrote it. All right, let, let me just pause. Did anybody um, get a chance to look at their Bible and see if you have an author. My Bible says um, the first book of Moses called Genesis and Exodus, it says the second book of Moses called Exodus. The second book, all right. So it's, it's very much attributed to Moses very much attributed to Moses. All right, everybody, let's let's do some study. I want you to pull out your uh, Bible. And I want you to let's do a little exercise. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, and then I want you to scoop down to verse 31. Exodus. That's the second book of the Bible. I want you to go to chapter 16. Uh, and I want you to scoot down to 31. OK, scoot down to verse 31 and uh, we are. Let me see if I, I'll pull it up and just in case if anybody wants to see it on the screen. And if I can get a. Uh, let me get a volunteer. I'm going to pull it up on the screen so we can see it. Can somebody start reading 31 through 36? I'll get it up here on the screen for us. Um, I have it been from the King James Version. That was in the year's Bible. I had it right now. It's OK from there. You got King James. And the house of Israel. Oh. Yes. Okay. Uh, I love King James. It'll take me a second to get to one of the other versions. Right? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yes. Professor Barry, I have a question. Sure. Um, okay, so she said that uh, Moses, Moses had wrote book Genesis 1 and Exodus. So I have a question. My question is, um, so when, which I don't know if anybody is able to answer this or not, but when Moses was up in the mountain, you know, talking to God and whatnot, was mm -hmm. that how he got all the, is that how, you know, all the information was talked about? You get what I'm saying? 
like because then it says like in the beginning there was there was nobody like it was void true so that that is an awesome question so this is where we come back to authorship and uh as we said when things are attributed to a person so we so uh i think it was janice said in, in her bible and in mine too um it is commonly attributed to genesis Exodus, much of the Pentateuch really is commonly attributed to Moses. Either he wrote it, he dictated it, he told somebody about it and they jotted it down. And when we say attributed to y'all, we don't really know, no. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> we it don't is. really know for sure, for sure. Because this is so old. The, these these things are so old. And they attribute it to who, put it like this, who would know and who would be wise around that time that could probably gather that information, who was like the head runner. And they probably, ah, probably Moses, you know, not to say that he didn't have anything to do with it. Maybe he did. Uh, Maybe he told his people to write some things down. Maybe he he did it. Maybe he dictated it. We don't really know, know for sure, but it's attributed to him. Did I answer your question, De Dejanir? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Okay, so we're going to go. I'll, I'll read it right here. Um, we're going to go to Exodus 16, verses 31 through 36. I'm going to give you the New International Version. And so we're answering this question. If Moses wrote most of this, did he really? The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was like, excuse me, it was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. Um, the Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. So when we get here, well, we had a little part in verse 36. When we get here, sometimes scholars say we're not really sure if he wrote certain parts because certain parts of the book of Exodus sound one way. And then there are other parts that sound like it could be another person speaking for Moses. OK, and then there are going to be other parts that you're going to see as we start reading who writes the book after he's dead. It surely wasn't Moses writing, you know, <laughs> somebody had to pick it up. OK, so there are going to be parts where you say, hmm, maybe um, maybe he wrote this, but it really doesn't matter who is the exact person. We're just so thankful that it was written. Let me go back to our lesson. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, let me know if everybody can see my slide. It says background of Exodus. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Now. Let's go back and we're going to keep talking about this book. Now, it's hard to believe that all of Exodus was written by Moses because the book also records his birth. Now, I know we know a lot of stuff, but I don't know too much about my birth. You know, <laughs> if you go, everybody go to. Exodus chapter, um, actually, I want you to go to Exodus chapter two. Go to Exodus chapter two. 
um, you know, um, my parents may have shared some things or my sister may have shared some things about when I was born, but I don't really, I don't know the story. Um, okay. All right, so we're going to go to Exodus chapter 2. We're going to go to 1 through 10. When somebody gets there, I want to read, I want you all to hear these words. So when somebody gets there, do you mind reading verses 1 through 10 for us? Start with which now? Okay, we're going to go to Exodus chapter 2. Can you start with verse 1? And we're going to stop at 10. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a uh, papyrus papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the weeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the weeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then, then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. And the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed to him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. Thank you. Thank you. That's where we come to our trivia question. What does Moses' name mean? Did you hear what James read? She named him Moses. So what does Moses mean? I drew him out of the water. Drew him out to draw out. To draw out. Let me just stay right there. That's that's powerful, isn't it? She named him Moses. His name means to draw out in Hebrew means to draw out. Draw out. Exodus. Isn't that something? In the book of Exodus. <laughs> um, and the work of Moses, his I guess we could call it right, his ministry was to lead people out. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. She said, I drew him out of the water. So that's the reason why she called him Moses. All right, this is good. So we're going through some background. We read, thank you, James, read one through 10 in chapter two. This is the called the birth narrative of Moses. Uh, Professor? Yes. When you were saying that one other thing came to mind about his name, draw out of water, was the uh, significance of going through the Reed Sea. True. Right. And he had to come I, I out of that. That connection together, yes. Right. The, uh, the, the river. Yeah. Very good. Very good. A lot of, uh, uh, um, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but a lot of the names, actually all of the names, Old Testament, New Testament, have so much meaning, so much meaning to the person. All right, so this gives us a look at chapter two, the birth narrative, where we could say, well, Moses may have heard some things from his family, okay, um, or from others to say this is how he was born. But this also gives us a question mark to say, hmm, maybe somebody else recorded the birth. 
the birth narrative, should I say? Hmm. <laughs> Makes us think, right? We're thinking. All right. Now, with every book in the Old or New Testament, with every book, we ask ourselves, who is the attributed author? Who do we think wrote it? And what was the purpose? Every book in the canon has a purpose. No book was thrown in there just to hold space. Every book has a purpose. So this one of the purposes, there's many purposes to the book of Exodus. Um, one of the purposes is that Moses, you see Moses's commission. He's called to be a leader uh, of the Israelites. He didn't raise his hand. He didn't sign up for a job interview. He is called. And so you see within that, within the book of Exodus, you see the creator God's movement with Moses. You see how the how God um, nurtures him, teaches him, gives wisdom on how to be a leader of these, what many, many may call the Israelites stiff necked, um, stubborn people, <laughs> much like us. Another purpose of Exodus is to show God's protection and favor to the Israelite people. Um, the book of Exodus shows that God never left them, even though they went through horrible situations, horrible treatment. And remember, Exodus has so many correlations to our enslaved ancestors. So it, this was another book of encouragement for them, even though if they couldn't read it, the stories were encouragement to say that if the Lord God could be with these people of Israel and help them and still be with them and still show up and feed them and protect them during horrible times, then the creator God could be with them in on, on the plantation. Okay, another purpose of Exodus is that God will judge the people that harm his people. Mm. And I'm telling you, Exodus was such an encouragement. I keep going back to it, to the African-American experience during slavery, because what was the key thing? Well, if I can't beat Massa, if, if I can't um, stop him from lynching my family, if I can't stop him from raping my daughters, I know that God is going to take care of him at some particular point. Okay. So that was, um, there are many purposes, but I want you to catch those purposes of the writing of this book. All right, I want you to help me doing here. What do want? Okay, look on the screen. I want you to see this image on the right. This is Yahweh. Yahweh. And this is how Yahweh, name for God, is written in Hebrew. And Jewish people revert, revered and honored God so much that they could not and will not, to this day, write out the creator God Yahweh's full name. And so they will only write Y-H W H instead of um, adding the vowels there, Y A H W E H. Yahweh is another name for God. But once again, I want you to remember that in Hebrew, you see how it's written in Hebrew. I'm not going to ask you to write it like that. <laughs> but remember that is that the Jewish uh, ancestors did not and still to this day will not write out the full name of God because they revered the creator so much that they felt that it was impolite. It was um, such a weighty name that it, you just couldn't write out the entire name Yahweh. The name Yahweh also means, <clears throat> also means God is a protector and a deliverer. And so when we're in the book of Exodus, remember Exodus was the Israelite people moving out of what area? Where were they moving out of? Uh, Egypt. They were moving out of Egypt. 
they were moving out of Egypt. So so pay attention to names and what names mean. So they called the God, they called God in their Hebrew language, Yahweh, one of protector. They needed protection. God know it. And deliverer. Deliver us, Lord, to some other safe place. All right. If you have, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I have one more question. Um, dealing with like who wrote the book, you know, like last semester, how we were talking about um, the synops, the synopsis, the synopsis, synoptic gospels. Yeah, like how you know we had three, and then we had that mystery person. Is that how? Does that thing still apply to this area now, or no? No. So those uh, that that's going to be New Testament. Uh, that's going to be for the New Testament. But with Old Testament, here's the tricky thing and the hard thing. These writings are so old. Um. New Testament is old too, but these writings were so old, they were found on tablets, they were found in pieces. Um, that's the reason why we just don't really, really know who wrote what. New Testament, we can really pinpoint people because the time was a, um, advanced a little bit more, much more. Um, but no, Dejanere, those theories don't apply to Old Testament where you, you have you know, these, you know, like Mark and Luke and so-and-so borrowed borrow from this one. No, so it wouldn't be the same way in Old Testament. Okay. The, the, the key thing, the thing that leaves us in limbo as scholars for Old Testament is that it is very hard because of the time frame and because these things are so old and they weren't intact Okay, so let's say if you, we unearthed something out here and we found a tablet with some writings on it, we don't know really who did it. Then we have to figure out who lived around in that area and we're going to have to pinpoint it. So that's the reason why, based on what the scriptures are talking about, they'll attribute it to who was around that time frame, who was wise, who would have something to do with this writing. And it goes to particular groups of people. Not to say that that person, not to say that Moses didn't write. Um, Moses, maybe Moses had a group of people to help him. But we mm -hmm. don't really know if he did all the chapters. Okay, makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So let's go back here. If you have your book with you I got my um you can you can do this I'm looking at my time you see me looking down um you can do this a little bit later on page 114 and 115 you can go to there's a table there um figure 5.2 and this talks about the plagues now remember do y'all remember on the previous slide when I talked about the purposes of exodus one of the purposes that I had on there is that God showed up and said, look, if you're going to mess with my people, I'm going to come after you. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Now, when we look at those plagues on page 114 and 115 of your book, you can take a look at that. There's a big conflict between the, the Hebrews, the Israelite people, and their oppressor, Pharaoh. Pharaoh is not getting down with them. Pharaoh doesn't like them and is oppressing them and forcing them into slavery. Also during this time, Egypt has many gods. They are not um, monotheistic. What's monotheistic? One God. One God. They are polytheistic. They honor the sun and they may honor the rock and things like that. So um, Egypt did not have one, one God. They were, you know, they had many gods. And so we will see when uh, Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and gets these uh, instructions, these 10 commandments from the creator God. One of those commandments says what about gods? You only have one God, honor one God. Yeah, that should have no other God before me. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So let's just pause right there, scholars.
Moses goes up and he says, look, I'm, I, I, got, I got the real deal from the creator God. I got these rules. I got these laws. I got these commandments. And this is how the Lord God said that we are to live. You are worshiping all these uh, 25 gods. And God said, you just need to stop that. Okay. Now you got a conflict. Do they like that? And when I say they, the Egyptian people who is led by Pharaoh, you think they liking what Moses is saying? No. No. So here we go into conflict because it's like, okay, well, how are you going to come off this mountain and tell me what I'm supposed to be doing? We've been doing, <laughs> we've been doing this all the time. You know how people do. I'm not trying to change. And so um, we see in the book of Exodus that the creator God is like, okay, I'll fix you. If you're not going to listen to the one who I sent, I will send plagues. What was the purpose of sending the plagues? One of them was to uh, let the Egyptians know that uh, there was only one God. So each of the plagues uh, represented uh, the uh, battle between God and some of the Egyptian gods and God was to God proved through each of the plagues that he was uh, sup far superior. Far superior, right. If you don't have it, you know, uh, the creator God was had more power than Pharaoh. Very good. I heard somebody else. Did you want to jump in? What I heard somebody. I was oh. going to say, um, through divination, showing like, you know, God's bigger than divination because a lot of them dealt with sorcery and divination. Very good. Uh, show that God's power was bigger than what they were doing, how they were worshiping their uh, small gods. Very good. Each plague. So what was the purpose of the plague as well? To show God's power, to show God's might, to show uh, that the creator God wasn't playing with them. And each plague was also meant to defeat an Egyptian god. Y'all remember that for next week. Each plague was meant to defeat an Egyptian god. Can y'all tell me, uh, you can open your mic, how many plagues, how many plagues were sent? If you're looking at the table. Ten. Ten, very good. Ten plagues. And um, I'm not sure if you have it open, if you're looking at the table. Can somebody give me some examples of some of those plagues? They were just nasty. Nasty. Hell, hell, ball, locusts, darkness, gnats, frogs. Yeah. The Nile turned to blood. I said it turned to blood. Oh, yeah. Just, just, this is stuff. I don't, I don't think I would ever want to, <laughs> I don't want to experience any one of these. And especially in the, in the one, the big one, uh, we sure don't want this one. Parents, the killing of the firstborn children don't want that. And um, thank you. So these plagues were meant to send a clear message to Pharaoh that you're not in control. OK, once again, um, during American slavery, slaves often compared Pharaoh to their oppressor. In many, I'm going to see if I can find one. In many Negro spirituals, Pharaoh is mentioned. Oh, there's a song that's, and y'all, I can't sing, but there's a song that's coming to my head. Um, have you ever heard, uh, Oh, Mary, Don't You Weep? It's a, uh, um, somebody can sing. I can't sing. Uh, Tell Martha not to mourn. Uh, Pharaoh's army was drowned in the Red Sea. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. Y'all can look it up. I can't sing the song. But many Negro spirituals had the word or the reference of Pharaoh uh, in it. Okay. All right. We're about to finish up. Um, let's do this. I want to go down to talk about that we got to talk about the Passover before we leave 
the Passover is very important to Old and New Testament. So I apologize for moving fast. I want y'all to go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And then we're going to head down to 21. Exodus chapter 12. And 21. All right. So the Passover. I love Jewish traditions. I'm not Jewish, but I, I love how they honor their history. And in essence, the time I was going to ask you this question, do Jewish people still celebrate the Passover? Yes. 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 Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. In 2022, 2023 and on, they are going to celebrate it. Why? Because they remember. There's going to be more information on page 117 about the Passover in your textbook. We're going to go to we're going to go to Exodus 12, 21 through 27. I'm going to read this in the essence of time. Then Moses summoned all of the elders of Israel and said to them, go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood of the ba in the basin and put some of the blood on the top on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Okay, so they were marking their doors. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, remember this was a plague, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the door frame and will what? Pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance. Did y'all catch that verse 24? Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance. For who? You and your descendants. For you and your but descendants. Yeah. So so that that helps us answer that question. Why do they continue to celebrate it? Our, Jew, our Jewish friends, they, they take that thing seriously. So if it's said in here, we got to keep this is an ordinance. Some, somebody tell me what is an ordinance? A suggestion? A law. It's a, a law. law. A commandment. A law, a commandment. A you better do it kind of thing. For you and your. So, so Moses is talking. For y'all right here living now. And your descendants, oh my goodness, for generations and for generations and for generations to come. Uh, let me keep going. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does the ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. Okay, we're going to pause right there. That was verse 27. This gives us so much background to the Passover. Uh, I don't want to say holiday, not holiday, observance. So the Jewish and the Jewish people today say we still going to remember how the creator God brought our family members way, 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 way back when in Egypt, when they were in bondage. And we're going to celebrate how the creator God brought them out. OK, somebody um, somebody can Google this. When was Passover celebrated this year in 2022? April 15th to April 23rd. April 15th through the 23rd. Okay, so, and I believe it, does it use, is it before Easter? It's before Easter, I believe. So, I wanted to bring that up. I know we're not in a New Testament class, but um, Passover will be very important in the New Testament as, um, you're talking about Jesus, uh, the crucifixion, the Last Supper happens during Passover. Okay. 
All right, let's see. Oh, Ooh, we had time. So this is what we talked about the Ten Commandments. I know we're short on time here. We talked about the Ten Commandments. You're going to find them in Exodus chapter 20, 1 through 17. You can go through that later. We did talk about some of them today, but these commandments are known as the Decalogue. Y'all remember that word, Decalogue, meaning ten. And God uh, spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai and gave him these directions. He said, write these things down. And when you go back down, you tell the people this is what they're supposed to do because they act enough. Um, and we're very familiar. Most of us are familiar with the Ten Commandments and you see them there. Uh, if you're in the religious studies class, we said sometimes, I don't know if they still post them, but sometimes they're in like courthouses and things. All right, and we're going to pause right here. OK, so remember, uh, remember the Ten Commandments, you're going to find that in Exodus chapter 20. Y'all remember that for next week. Uh, and these commandments were meant to, there are 10 of them, but it doesn't mean that those are the only 10 that <clears throat> People should follow. OK, but those 10 gave a what's the word? A foundation for the Israelite people on how to live, how to treat people, how to treat your spouse, um, how to treat your, your items, your neighbor, uh, worship and things like that. OK. All right, let's just pause right here. Let me show you. Any questions for me? All right, all right. Very good. I was gonna say I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Going back to the Passover thing, um, I feel like that is very relevant even for now because thinking about even the plagues that God said that He's gonna do when He returns as well too. You know, like though that we may not be able to like you could you know, cover your doors and everything else with blood or whatever, but it's not like how it says, you know, we don't worship in, in physical, you know, we worship in the spirit. So it's still the same thing. Like, you know, if that blood is not on your heart and on your spirit, you get what I'm saying? Like you're going to get hit with whatever plague that God sees best fit. So, so you're saying, okay, so in the Old Testament, they sprinkled uh, actual blood from an animal in the New Testament, because of the new covenant with Jesus, um, uh, animal sacrifice was no longer needed because Christ fulfilled that with his shedding of blood. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure. So um, when we say blood, metaphorically, the that spirit, um, that um, you know, I, I plead the blood of Jesus over my children, right? But I'm not, um, what's the word? I don't need to go and sacrifice the animal in the backyard. And <laughs> Marshall, yeah. Marshall, you're laughing, right? The poor children going to school, like, what happened <laughs> to you? And we will call, what you call it, social services, because your mama is crazy. But I can speak it. Right. And because of that spirit, because of that sacrifice that has already been done, we don't need the tangible. Am I saying it right? I don't need the tangible animal. I don't need the tangible blood because that has already been done through the sacrifice of Jesus in New Testament. Yeah. Because <laughs> it says that even in the in the in revelations that, you know, the the death angel is going to come back around again, but and people are going to wish that they can die, but they can't die and things like that, you know. And Revelation is one that many. You know, I, I did not take a course in Revelation in some seminary. There was a course and I stayed away from it, but I really should have taken it because it is one of many metaphors, a lot of deep meaning, but it is a it's a deep and heavy book that we we need to know. It's apocalyptic. And uh, it's it's full of full of good nuggets that we need to know. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you, scholars. You are on it. All right. 
Um, anything else before we leave out? Remember your, let's see, remember your discussion for this week. Uh, it reviews your genre chart. I think that's all you had. Uh, oh, and if you haven't done so already, you can uh, register for your spring classes. All right, everyone. It's so good meeting with you all. I will see you next week. All right. All right. Okay. Thank care. you. Thank you. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. You too. You too. So get out and get some of this fall weather. <laughs>